Thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and thank you very much for coming, spending this morning with us. It's uh, an exciting week in Washington. I really appreciate that. The reason why we wanted to have this meeting organized together with the Atlantic Council on financing the energy transition is to explain the new proposed energy lending policy of the bank and where we stand and where we intend to go. Uh, energy issues, climate issues can sometimes get a little bit rough, as you can see here, <laughs> but uh, uh, we win. So this policy is needed now more than ever as we support countries in their transition towards a low carbon economy. And that is important to say because it's, it's easy to say we must move out of fossil fuels and all this. You must enable countries and regions to do so. And that's where we have a specific role to play. It's timely, given the discussions on the Paris Agreement ahead of 2020, when the national determined contributions are expected. It is ambitious, reflecting the new EU climate and energy targets, and it is a paradigm shift for international financial institutions because the EIB is proposing the phasing out of our support to fossil fuels. Ladies and gentlemen, in the history of this EU bank, energy has always been at the core. The first energy projects that the bank financed 60 years ago in the early 1960s were a coal-fired power plant in that, and then almost isolated West Berlin, Bivak project. This plant is still in operation today, uh, which illustrates perfectly well the lifespan of infrastru energy infrastructure. And we have to remind us of this when we talk about new projects. Some people who put an enormous pressure on our political masters, or on us, or both, must take into effect that from the point of view of a bank, it is important that you look at the lifespan of the project. And if you know that 5, 10, 15, or maybe even 25 years from now, that installation will go out of production, you have to be aware that you're now programming stranded assets. So from, the, from a banking point of view, it is not just a question of political um, will, goodwill. It reminds, this project reminds us that the projects the bank is financing today will still be operating to 40 to 50 and even beyond 2050. And by then we have to meet our 2050 target of net zero emission. We therefore need to ensure the correct direction of travel. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at, at a crossroads. We must act immediately and swiftly if we want to ensure a sustainable transition to a net zero emissions economy. The accumulation of greenhouse gases has caused average temperatures to rise by almost one degree Celsius globally above the pre-industrial pre levels. And two thirds of this increase has occurred in the short time since 1975. So if business con continues as usual, we ha will have stoked a rise in global average temperatures of four degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And now we just had a finance minister's meeting in Helsinki. Uh, if you go to Helsinki in late autumn, you might arrive at the idea that four degrees warmer wouldn't be such a bad idea. And sometimes there are even times in, in Washington or New York where that applies as well. But look what 4% uh, four, four degrees Celsius, more or less means. Well, we know from situation which have seen heat waves recently, what that means in terms of drought, forest fires, crop failures, food shortages, disease pandemics, they become commonplace events, potentially displacing millions of people and triggering a lot of migration as well. We should therefore we should remember that the present wave of migration in the Middle East has its, had its origins to a large extent in drought and other climate-related problems. But now four degrees. Well, degrees are measured, in Celsius at least, by absolute one-digit figures. In order to get a sense what's really happening, you have to 
discuss about a tenth of degrees in climate changes, temperature changes. If just for the sake of argument, you imagine temperatures until 2100 would not rise by four degrees Celsius, but would go down by four degrees Celsius. Then we can see what is happening because that was the case if we go back just a few years. But when it was four degrees colder on this planet, Washington would have been under kilometers of ice. So it's only four degrees, but a huge impact. So we have to take it seriously. And in Europe, things have changed dramatically. The awareness of people have changed. The year 2019 was defining. I have the honor to chair an institute and think tank for European affairs in Berlin. And in the context of the European Parliament elections, I invited 40 youth organizations, by the way, non-political youth organizations, sports youth, fire brigades, what have you. And we wanted to thank them because they had launched an initiative in order to encourage their peers to participate actively in the European Parliament elections. We want to thank them. And our president, President Frankfurter Steinmeier, uh, accepted my invitation and they came to us and spoke to these young people. And my re introductory remark, I said, Mr. President, you can see that nowadays it is possible to convince people to engage in the pursuit of political objectives. And in the response, he said, well, <laughs> You're completely right. We can mobilize them. But was, what is much more important is they will mobilize us. This movement will not simply disappear. So we have to take it serious. And uh, we now have opinion polls in, in Europe saying that, according to which, 93% of the population consider climate change an important challenge and 78 a very important challenge. This would not, not have been thinkable uh, even one or two or three years ago. So the political landscape is changing. Through the last decade, we evolved our policies and priorities to help fight the financial and sovereign debt crises and support jobs and recovery, particularly by improving SMEs' access to finance. Still a huge challenge. They remain important objectives, but there can be little doubt that the most urgent challenges facing the European Union, and indeed the world, today are environmental, notably the challenge to slow and adapt to rising global temperatures, and to maintain a strong multilateralism. The IPCC reminds us in stark terms that the world is nowhere close to meeting the targets agreed at Paris and that on current trends we face potentially catastrophic risks. We are being accused of running ahead of the multilateral financial institutions in the pursuit of the climate objectives. The Paris Accord would not have come about if the multilateral development banks and the IFIs would not have gotten their act together on the Paris contributions and commitments. And indeed, we were the driving force among the MDBs. And we intend to be that again when it comes now to the next set of objectives. EIB has always been at the forefront of multilateral development bank efforts on climate. Since 2012, we have provided around $170 billion of financing, supporting over $600 billion of investment in climate action and environmental sustainability, making the EIB group the world's largest multilateral providers of finance for climate projects. Since we set our climate action finance target first in 2010, our ambition has been increasing. In 2015, we pledged to provide $100 billion for climate action projects in the five-year period to 2020. We are delivering on that target. Indeed, since 2016, we have invested approximately 71 billion into these projects. Having said this, the EIB can and is ready to become even greener. The EIB group is currently finalizing its increased ambition for 2030 climate action and environmental sustainability. Our approach builds on three pillars. One, an increase in our own financing. Last year, 
Nearly 30% of the EIB's new commitments worldwide were dedicated to climate and environmental goals. By the way, in Paris, we had committed to 25%, so we're doing 30%. Now I'd like the EIB to be bolder, much bolder, and aim for 50% for these objectives by 2025. A commitment, secondly, to grow sustain sustainable finance from both billions to trillions. By working with our public and private partners, we aim to unlock at least $1.1 trillion of investment by 2030. This will include a marked increase in support for climate adaptation and resilience. And thirdly, building on our 2015 climate strategy, we will align all the EIB Group's financing activities with the principles of goal and goals of the Paris Agreement by the end of 2020. There must be climate in everything we do, because if we are proud of investing 50% of our lending into climate action, and with the rest of our lending, we destroy the effects that we have produced with the positive climate results, uh, it would not be really very credible. So that has to go hand in hand. That this is not easy, you'll probably discuss later with the panel, and my friend and colleague, the Vice President Andrew McDool, will be talking about this as well, I suppose, because you have to be responsible to your investors. Our bank, which has a balance sheet of $600 billion, has never seen more than 14.7 billion euros of cash injection. The rest is callable capital, but most of it is support from the capital markets who give us every year between 70 and 90 billion euros of bond purchases. So now you have to be precise what that is. We have the advantage that people trust us, that we are considered an engineering bank uh, and uh, relatively good economists who never produce uh, losses. But still, it's a question of trust. And when you now sell a green bond, or in the next phase, we have begun now to sell sustainability awareness bonds, then you need something that, in the ideal case, you can call a taxonomy that describes precisely what that is. Don't take a piece of pe paper, white, paint it green and say, this is now a green bond. No. Your investor who gives you this money wants to know what happens with the money. And you must be accountable for that and transparent. And the whole thing must be sustainable. For green bonds, this has been, to a large extent, ex achieve, achieved. I still see a lot of, let's call it green cheating. And we must stop that even more. But for sustainability awareness bonds, this is going to be a dif difficult taxonomy that we will need. Because if we don't do that, we will not be able to finance these huge amounts. Taxpayers' money will never suffice to reach these objectives. We need to talk to the private sector. We need to speak the language of the private sector. We need to draw them in instead of running the risk of being accused of crowding out. The new 2030 EU climate and energy targets agreed as part of the Clean Energy for All Europeans package aims for at least 40% cut in greenhouse gas emissions from the 1990 level, at least 32% share of renewable energy in final energy demand, and at least 32.5% energy efficiency improvements. And the European Commission, supported so far by 24 member states, has gone further and proposes that the EU, EU commit to net zero emissions by 2050. For us, this was very encouraging. Both the European Council in June was very clear in this direction, and in her difficult speech after her nomination as president of the European Commission, where she won that thing very narrowly, she had to be ambitious on climate issues as well in order to get a majority, and she did it, and uh, that meant that the European Commission president has committed to that objective as well. So. Current greenhouse gas emissions will need to be cut by 50% in the next 10 years and by another 50% by 2040. The energy sector will have to lead the way. Energy-related investments will need to double to more than $440 billion per year of investment in the next decade and to over $600 billion per year in the decade after in order to take nearly all greenhouse gas emissions out of our energy system by 2040. 
The incoming European Commission announced in September 2019 ambitious objectives to further increase decarbonation efforts with a proposal for a European Green Deal aimed at making the EU the world's first climate neutral continent and this already by 2030. This includes calls for the bank to increase its support to climate action and to assume a stronger role as the EU climate bank. We welcome this and the bank is ready, stepping up to this challenge as I have outlined. Business as usual or even incremental policy changes will not deliver on these ambitions. Decisions we make today have long-term consequences. Policies need to change and change quickly. If we get it wrong, we will lock in high carbon energy infrastructures that ultimately will make the energy transition much more costly for us, for us all in both financial and environmental terms. So the new EIB energy lending policy, which was controversially but constructively, that was a good thing, was constructively discussed this week in our board, will be an important step in this regard. Our proposal has a strong focus on energy efficiency, renewable energy, power grids, and research and development, because we believe these challenges can only be met with the highest level of application of top technologies. The bank has in recent years delivered debt findings of around 13 to 15 billion per year in the energy sector, helping the creation of roughly $44 billion of new assets. And this is significant, but still small compared to Europe's overall needs, never mind the world. The question before us today is how to best use the scarce financial and human capacity at EIB to best affect to accelerate the energy transition. Vice President Andrew McDool, who is leading the review of the EIB lend energy lending policy, will present the content of this policy. For him, probably this meeting today is quite a relaxed event because he has been constantly um, under fire in, in the last weeks and uh, went through heroic uh, struggle. And we are very grateful to him that he is doing this. And we will, he will convince you as well. Uh, but before I let him do that, let me end with one last important point. We must not forget those countries which are less well advanced and on the road to low carbon economy have serious problems. That some areas, communities, sectors will be more deeply affected by this transition than others. And this is something we must take head on. Otherwise, we will not take the people along on this journey. We are fully aware that some regions are very dependent on fossil fuel production, in particular from coal, and have different needs, and we are committed to ensuring that no one is left behind. We need to focus, in particular, not only on energy security and energy supplies in these regions, but on jobs and growth. We have seen the detrimental effects of, on communities and regions in the past when a transition is not fair and just. So we stand ready to develop new products and ideas to make this vision a reality. And I thank you very much for your attention.